Hello and welcome everyone to episode 11 of Talking Shop with Tony Abbey. My name is David Quinn, Chief Marketing Officer here at Nutrients, and I'll be your host for today. This series is part of our wider community programme of online events that we are delighted to be bringing you. You can see more details on both of our websites, nifims.org and fetraining.net, and hopefully find something else of interest as well. This week, Tony's looking at unit conversions, and he's got some horror stories for you all. As usual, we'll kick off with a 30-minute presentation, then open things up to your questions and comments. So, without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Tony. Thank you very much, David, and welcome to Episode 7. These episodes are really rolling around now. So, units in FEA, some horror stories. And I've dug in a little bit into my past. Uh, we're looking at uh, some of the, the unit problems. Um, also, there have been quite a few contributions from people. And thank you for those people who sent emails in um, and have given me ideas and suggestions. I haven't folded any of them indirectly, but you certainly set me thinking about some of them. I ended up with so many horror stories that I really ran out of time to, to kind of present too many. But again, really, really thank those that have contributed beforehand. So this is a flying tale, cautionary tale, and I do apologize for telling a flying story. Um, many years ago, many more than I care to remember, I, I have been a flying instructor part-time, but I took a one-year sabbatical um, as uh, a full-time flying instructor. So this was my um, my attempt to uh, to um, kind of set the world to rights as a young man, and uh, that's um, basically uh, what I did. So um, uh, my flying club, it was based in uh, in Cambridge, but they decided to start a satellite operation in Girona in Spain. Um, when I was out there, it folded. So the call came Garmo, and this is Garmo, a much-loved old Cessna 172B, very old, can you bring Garmo home? Well, yeah, being young and it's kind of a bit of a challenge. So the bit of the challenge was um, it's actually uh, 865 nautical miles to fly up there. Um, and so the talent challenges became the Pyrenees, which is the graveyard for many people trying to take a shortcut home. Massive Centrale, which is another graveyard for people trying to sh take a shortcut home. Spanish ATC, apologize to those who are Spanish calling in. They actually changed my flight plan. So about here over the ocean, I had a flight plan which kind of went up the middle, and they rejected my flight plan. You always have a backup. So I said, okay, I'm going to my backup. Thank you very much, and switched to French ATC without the chance for them to say uh, non or whatever you say in, in Spanish. So 865 nautical miles. Notice the units. So that's the theme for our system, nautical units. That's about 15% um, on top of uh, statute miles. Cruising speed is 90 knots, so that's nautical miles per hour, 39 gallons of fuel, and the units there, and that's really the key to the story. What are the units of the gallons of fuel? Navigation was another issue. There's no VOR. Uh, that's an old uh, beacon following system. GPS was just sci-fi in 1987. There's no way of, um, so you're basically on your own. So it's like compass, timing, um, uh, IFR, uh, for those of you who fly, was I follow roads or railways, as the case may be. And I had a chart, which wasn't much better kind of fidelity than this. There's about a million charts. So apart from that, it looked, uh, looked very promising. Well, the first leg uh, was going to be Girona to, to Bordeaux. And um, the forecast winds down the La Grande Valley, which is essentially the valley flowing down here, was about 10 knots. Actually, uh, after the event, and it became very clear, because I felt like I was standing still, it was actually between 25 and 35 knots. Garmo on a good day could manage about 95 knot cruise. So it actually took me in the end, I'll check my logbook, it took me 4.7 hours to get from Girona to Bordeaux, uh, which I think you could probably do faster driving. Um, it's a 200 nautical mile leg. The fuel burn was around 8.5, again, units, US gallons per hour. So as it turned out, I should have, I thought I had a 40.6 US gallons. Total tanks, uh, sorry, are going to burn 40, uh, just over 40 gallons. Total tanks were 48 gallons. So in my mind was like this 15% reserve. Um, but it didn't quite work out like that. And uh, that was, again, um, very bad planning, very bad airmanship. I used the wrong units. Uh, one imperial gallon is 1.2 US gallons. And I'd, I'd converted the tank capacity in error to get 48 US gallons. So that gave me my little margin. So the tanks are 40 US gallon. I'm burning you 40 US gallons, so no reserve. Now, I saw the fuel gauge dropping down, and uh, I had to kind of make quick decisions as we got towards, or I got to Bordeaux. I was kind of all on my own, very lonely all on my own. 
uh, alternate, do I, do I land for fuel, whatever, the usual kind of um, uh, <laughs> flying type for issues. Um, and when I got there, um, basically, um, the guy, uh, this is a cartoon, but I never forget the guy, he, he, he actually said worse than this, but I think it was in French. He, when I did a refuel, he basically was refueling a vapor-filled tank, which is a very uh, terrible thing to admit uh, as, as a pilot. Uh, I don't fly any longer, by the way, for, for other reasons. Um, and so um, I don't know why I did it. Um, I could have misread the placard on the plane. I could have misread the operating manual. I could have just fumbled the calculator. For those of you that remember, um, we were still using analog calculators, and I think people still do, although now um, everything is kind of digital. You can do things very quickly. So somewhere in this slide rule, there's fuel conversions, there's range, all those kind of calculations you do in your flight planning. So um, I'd put uh, a margin in there, I thought, but I didn't have a margin. So that was basically the horror story. Um, luckily, I didn't have to land out. That would have been very, very embarrassing. Uh, uh, there were plenty of old airfields down there, so that would have been hopefully okay. But again, um, a kind of a lesson. Uh, wrong, wrong units. So that was a early personal uh, uh, um, error. I've done the same kind of thing driving. Uh, I flipped over to Canada from the US, and um, that uh, SUV had a nice little button we could convert from miles to kilometers. And of course, I forgot which uh, system I was on. So and lots and lots of examples like that. I'm sure many of you have done similar things to that. So that kind of set the theme for this week's webinar is basically um, uh, conversion between unit systems is one of the biggest problems. Um, the US system, which is the old imperial system, when I was a, a schoolboy, the back of our, um, our, uh, tech, uh, our exercise books, we had all of the units. They were called imperial units, obviously, from the old kind of uh, empire days. I, um, so the imperial to metric conversion is probably the most error prone, and here two gentlemen are kind of arguing it out. But there's lots of other traps in both systems. So I'm not going to focus just on whether you have this system or that system. And in fact, um, that kind of segues us into the first poll. So would you like to uh, take it away for that poll, David? Yeah, sure. Uh, just as a matter of interest, uh, we'll open a poll uh, just now. We'll open it for a few seconds. And if you can let us know whether you've used only metric, only US, or a mix of both uh, um, units throughout your career, uh, you should see the poll is now open. So on the right-hand side, you'll be able to have your responses there. So which units have you used throughout your career? Uh, a, only metric. B, only US units, or C, a mixture of both. I've known you for years, Tony. I've never heard that story before. That's terrifying. <laughs> that, that. <laughs> I, I must admit, I didn't expect to see the age of 40 when I was flying. It was, it was, I have many stories we can, I can tell you over a, a wee dram. <laughs> that, that, that must have been, must have been difficult. Must have been a difficult one. So we've got 15 seconds left to get your answers in for the poll. Uh, we're counting down. We will have the results very, very shortly. I think most people have responded so far. Uh, 60, yep, most people have responded. Three, two, one, and it's in. 51% uh, of people have used a mix of both. So so most people are, are comfortable. There we go. Well, I wouldn't say comfortable. That should have been a poll, <laughs> uh, poll question. That's interesting. Um, you end up with that, with that mix. I guess I should have said I'm kind of on the same project. And that's the difficulty when you have it on the same project. Well, thanks, for that, David. Thank you very much for that poll. Um, okay, so well, that's a, that's very good background. Thank you for that. So um, sometimes the um, coming to FEA things now. Sometimes the user interface tries to be a bit too helpful. So I've got some. Uh, I've obviously dummied these up, but um, the point is here. Sometimes the user interface is actually asking for specific units. So here, for example, Young's modulus. They are implying that you can type in gigapascals. So they want 190. Gigapascals. So you're kind of not putting in fundamental units, which would be newtons per meter squared there, but uh, put in 190. So I've put in my fundamental units because I didn't notice that. So I've got, I'm 1E9 too big. Or sometimes the other way around, they're giving you um, more fundamental units in that particular case, prompting. And you have in your mind, you just looked up 192 gigapascals. I don't know why I switched from 190 to 192. You, you look up 192 gigapascals, you just Google that. Well, that's not so good, but looked up your reference. And so you just type in 192. So you're now 1e to the 92 small. 
Um, and the, uh, we got to um, US equivalent. <clears throat> uh, there, for some reason, people sometimes like to use thousands of pounds per square inch. So um, you just type in 27.5, thinking of that's 1e to the 6, so millions of uh, pounds per inch, which actually has a horrible abbreviation MSI. So again, you're 1,000 too small. So a helpful interface, sometimes if you don't read it carefully, um, it can, can cause problems. Or sometimes the user uh, interface is agnostic, so it's up to you to figure out consistent units. Um, and some people love it, some people hate it. I actually prefer this because then I, it's up to me to have that set of consistent units. So here, in, this is assuming we're in pounds, inch pounds second system, the US system. This is in uh, the metric system, newtons kilogram seconds. The arbiter, the judge, is always right honorable FEA. Um, whatever comes through from the preprocessor, that's what comes through. So the, pre the solver is not going to actually figure out, well, they meant this or they meant that. It just takes that input file translated through from um, your user interface and says, this is what we're going to run with. So again, um, lots of, lots of uh, what I call finger trouble problems there. Um, other it's odd examples, I've tried to pull kind of a range of things through. This is um, a sign gantry we use on the uh, dynamics course. And I provide the solid geometry. And um, often we run into trouble because the geometry files contain metadata. So the header of the file, it usually includes a scaling factor from a baseline um, to whatever target unit of dimensions you think you're working in. The baseline is often in meters. So you think you're working inches or yards or feet or millimeters, whatever it might be. Please don't work in yards. But um, anyway, um, it's actually sitting there in, in metric units of a meter. And then the conversion, so that when it comes through, is, is um, done by reading and interpreting, interpreting that metadata. Now, sometimes it's very vulnerable to corruption or just deletion or it's just completely ignored. So sometimes on the course, we ha I actually have about nine different variants of the um, the geometry for people to write in, uh, read, read in, everything from uh, parasolid to, to step and so on, and different releases of that. So well, the first thing we've got to do is to, when we bring a model in, check the dimensions. So check the geometric dimensions first uh, of the CAD that you've brought in, so the geometry. If that's OK, then you're good to go. Then you can uh, add your materials, properties, loads, and so on. Um, if you don't, then uh, what can happen is you can get strange scaling effects. Now, they're usually uh, associated with metric to, to or meter to inch conversions. Sometimes all other odd things happen. So you need to check so that you, you think your sign gantry in this particular case is 156 by 183, 24. Um, and, but you're not. You've actually have got a little miniature model, like a little air fix kit, if you like, of the actual thing. But you're applying the full loading and the actual um, units which you think uh, are sitting there in your, um, in your, in your uh, base system. Um, so do the check first. And if it's wrong, then just scale it up. Um, and that's the easiest way. Usually there's a way to say, I've just got geometry, scale the geometry. If you do it later on downstream, then you're going to start to have to think about, well, what's that doing to my uh, Young's modulus, to my loads, uh, if it, or pressures, let's say, and so on. So, Again, um, a good lesson there is to, to kind of uh, watch out for that. I've seen that happen uh, an awful lot. And I, I've been subject to myself. Now, consistent units are really the key. Um, so to achieve consistent units, follow the governing equations. I guess um, the old um, uh, crime stories, spy stories say, follow the money. Well, this is kind of the equivalent. Follow the governing equations, and then you'll get uh, you, you, it gives you a good chance here. So I've pulled off some simple examples just to kind of warm up. Statics stresses force per unit area. So in the US, it's common to use, as I said, KSI. That's a thousand pounds force per inch squared. So the loads need to be thought of if we're going to use that, and that's what we want to have as our output. We need to apply those in a thousand pound force units. So on the input, when we say 8.92 force, we mean 8920. And if that's what we consistently use, then our stresses will come out in thousands of pounds uh, or, or KSI. So stress output in KSI units, 42.23 in our, in our contour plot, means 42,230. Now you can modify in the post-processor and say, I want to do a conversion on the fly. 
that's fraught with difficulties as well. So um, also the Young's modulus, you need to think about that, all the consistent uh, units there following the governing equations. So 1,000 pounds for its units there. If I got, I've got to put in 27.3 e to the 3, meaning 27.3 e to the 6 psi. So it can be tricky. I try and avoid it if possible. I try and work in fundamental units, um, but sometimes it is tempting to kind of do this. Um, for the US side, please stick to inches. Um, if you go to feet, like the area conversion is 144. Um, don't use yards. Um, we're not agricultural engineers, so yards, which is three feet. For those of you in Europe, who main, mainland Europe, I should say, mainland Europe, who don't know what I'm talking about, then um, uh, don't worry about it. A yard is an ancient kind of unit. Um, in, uh, in the metric side, again, we still have some issues because millimeters is a very common, very convenient unit. So there, um, uh, a, a millimeter is obviously a thousandth of a meter. So again, the consistent set of units, newtons per meter squared, I've got to convert that. Um, and so I've got a force here is just a stress equal, sorry, stress is just newtons per meter squared equals my force units, which are in newtons, divided by my area units, which are meters per second squared. So basically, I want to, to um, divide on this side by 1e to the 6, because I want to go from meter squared to millimeter squared. Um, but it's over, uh, it's already uh, um, on, underneath, as it were. So it actually ends up as a multiplication on this side. So I've got to work with 1e to the 6 newtons per meter squared equals and then it, I can got units of newtons per millimeter squared. I don't have the little triple bar there, which is consistently used to say this equates to. So I do apologize. And my font doesn't support that. But that's actually very convenient. And that gets encapsulated in many people's way of working. Because now the stress is in megapascals. So there you kind of luck out with the metric system. Or maybe back in the 18th century when it was invented, somebody thought this through. Who knows? So there, basically, a pascal is 1 newtons per meter squared. 1 megapascal is 1 e to the 6 newton meter squared. So we've got some nice units there. We've got 1 megapascal is equal 1 newtons per millimeter squared. So that actually works out quite nicely for you. As long as you know what you're doing, you're working newtons and millimeters uh, and seconds, obviously, and then your output is going to be in megapascals. And that, that's cool. Uh, again, as long as you know uh, kind of that's what you're doing. Now, there are more metric subtleties, and we, you think, well, the SI system, System International, which is uh, a strict um, newtons, kilograms, seconds, would, would kind of cover everything. And why, wouldn't, why would you mess with that? Well, there's all sorts of reasons. A decanewton is 10 newtons. That's liked in a lot of calculations. I've seen it in a lot of aerospace calculations, because it's roughly the force exerted by a kilogram on Earth. So again, force equals mass times acceleration. Because I do a lot of dynamics, that's key to me. Um, Newton's second law, again, follow follow the um, follow the equations. So there we've got one decanewton is one kilogram, and they round up 9.81 meters per second squared for g to about 10. So this is about a kind of a rough feel for that. And I've seen quite a lot of people use it. Gives you a sense of what that force is. A decanewton then is about the force exerted by um, a mass of, of one kilogram. Also used more directly is kilograms force. That's a more direct and convenient and accurate, sorry, accurate convenience. So a kilogram force is a kilograms times that acceleration, but now in, in the, with the, the more accurate uh, number. Now I've had a hard time with these um, uh, over the years, um, trying to interpret stresses working on projects where this is very, very popular. Um, uh, but uh, many people have used them throughout their careers. So if I were to say, don't ever use a decanewton or don't ever use a kilogram force, um, I, I wouldn't be very popular. You, you're used to it. You know how it fits in. But um, if you're coming new to the system, you kind of inherit a project now in these units. It can be very uh, can quite daunting. And you need to always go back to these kind of fundamental principles. Now, some systems are unitless. And sometimes, though, you think, well, that's great. I don't have to worry about it. But sometimes having no units can be a bit annoying or confusing. So uh, my favorite example is strain. Strain is changing length over original length. So that's not very friendly because there's, there's no units associated with that. But we, we tend to make up then labels. So there are two common alternatives, which are really labels. One is percentage strain. 
So 100% strain is a huge amount. That doubles the length. The strain is, is one. But there's a nice example. We sometimes talk about 0.2% offset. We, here we've got a stress strain curve, and we want to define legally, as it were, where the yield is. So we kick off with this 0.2% strain, draw a line parallel, intercept the curve here, shoot back across, and that's the definition then of 0.2% uh, offset yield strength. So there, percentage strain is, is handy. So 0.2% strain is beginning to kind of get some sort of meaning rather than just straining this sort of 0 0.002, which, um, again, is dimensionless. My other favorite is I'm working with composites. Um, sometimes we describe a limit strain allowable. So there I talk about like 3,000 micro strain as being my limit. Um, and that equates to 3e to the minus 3 strain. And 3e to the minus 3 strain, I don't know, it doesn't have a ring to it. Somehow 3,000 micro strain, 4,000 micro strain, 5,000 micro strain, those are units I kind of got used to. That's 0.3% strain. And we actually used to have allowables in the stress office for composites, which were covered everything. So I, I won't quote, a, well, I will give a number, but don't quote me on that, like 4,000 micro strain to cover fatigue, abuse loads, uh, hail damage, things like that was a nice kind of a unit to work with. It kind of gives a little bit more friendliness to the idea of, of strain. But again, you know, take it or leave it. You might have other you might have other labels for strain, other ways of thinking of this. So um, other units, angles of dimensionless units, so uh, unitless items. And this is often kind of catches up. Conversions between radians and degrees can be problematic. One radian is, is usually 57.3 is what we typically use there. And again, we go back to there, draw a circle, and think, well, 360 degrees, that's two pi radians. That's my conversion. The other one that kind of catches me out regularly is frequencies. Uh, and it's related to that, because frequency we can think of like a rotation, and like going around a circle. So we can think of radians per second, um, which is our fundamental units. If we deriving something often uh, from first principles, like, uh, like an eigenvalue calculation, is going to be um, quite very quickly. We get to radians per second, but cycles per second are nicer um, hertz. So that conversion there is a, is a huge trap. One radian per second equals 0.159 hertz. So um, in dynamics, we talk about a crossover frequency where we relate structural damping to viscous damping. There's one frequency where that is accurate, um, and often. Uh, in many solvers, that's quoted in radians per second, and you forget. You think, well, why would anybody quote radians per second? That's very unfriendly in many cases. Um, so that's, that we think of it in hertz. Then I'm actually out by um, this this amount here, which causes kind of chaos there. Um, or I, I got a frequency response plot. I think it's in hertz, but it's actually in radians per second and so on. So that's a very, very common error. And then RPM um, is sometimes... Uh, it should be perhaps the input. I'm thinking here of, um, uh, for example, like um, centrifugal loading. What is the uh, the spin rate? We'd think, well, logically, RPM would be a great thing to put in, but maybe the program actually wants radians per second or maybe even cycles per second. I fall into these traps kind of all the time, and I think many other people kind of will do as well. So we just kind of, kind of think it through each time what we're doing. Now, the elephant in the room is mass or weight and I thought long and hard about the way to best way to put this um, well the simple answer is just say it's a unit thing uh, I can look up online and doesn't one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds uh, that's pounds of weight well not really these are different concepts and we really need to be careful on these conversions here and in this particular case we've got something in kilograms something in pounds it's not just a numerical scaling between them and if you're faced with a multinational project involving dynamics or inertia, and you've got to have uh, mixed units, you're working with the US team, let's say, and the European team, it sounds like many of you, 50%, have been faced with that. You've got to set aside some time, project time, for what I call rationalization, beating people up to say, look, th this is right, it's OK, um, or believing uh, or, or getting up that, that kind of learning curve of faith to say these are equivalent systems. And it literally often involves tears. Um, uh, again, anybody who meets me on a conference or sees me around, this is another chance to buy me a beer, as I tell you all about um, how um, it took me six months to beat up a particular surveyor 
um, from a certification authority to convince him that my report was right. And I went all the way around many, many ways just to say, look, this is right. And philosophically, he just couldn't accept it. Now, the reason is that um, you go to the market to buy apples, you want to know how much you're getting for your money. Apples are weighed on a scale or a spring balance, as shown in here. But that measurement is a force exerted on this balance or spring. So in the old imperial units, now US units, using the you know, second law, we've got one pound force, which is what we're measuring. Well, what's it equal to? It's equal to um, acceleration due to gravity, and then something we're calling the mass. And the problem becomes, what's that definition of the mass? Well, we have to have consistent units. So acceleration due to gravity, different numbers are used, which is a problem. But 386.4 is something I've used throughout my career. Other people use 386, 386.2. Um, please don't use feet, because then it's 32.2. And that's one of the problems. It's, it's unit dependent. So this is still the basis of the US, US system. It's a pound weight system. Uh, length in inch, please don't use feet, or second. And as far as I'm aware, there's no legal definition of a mass in that system. You just don't define a mass. You define a weight, and then you figure out the mass by back calculating out of here. So that's where I kind of came from. I've been metricated, I think, to use that phrase, three times in my career at school, at university, and then in, in industry. Um, and after a while, you kind of get you kind of get a little bit lost about what everything is. In the meantime, over in France, they had a concerted effort to get much more fundamental, much more philosophical, defining how much uh, apple you were getting for your money. And literally, they want to know how much matter are you buying. So the problem is the amount of matter, you can't directly measure it. You have to reverse engineer it by measuring the force exerted by gravity. So it's kind of a bit of a circular loop there. But they did come up with this definitive mass of a kilogram. This one is actually a physical object, and here it is sitting underneath two bell jars and very, very carefully produced, preserved, the International Prototype Kilogram. So everything uh, is made of uh, um, platinum and iridium. So the amount of matter inside those two bell jars is the standard mass of kilo one kilogram. So everything is, is kind of relative to that. And they checked back from time to time to make sure that the kilogram hadn't drifted. And in fact, they found that with variations of gravity, cleanliness and outgassing of the fundamental material, um, actually there was a little bit of a drift. So um, I'm just trying to get my brain around this new idea. They want to go back to fundamental principles. So there's a thing called the Planck constant. There's a fundamental way of measuring um, uh, time. There's a fundamental way of measuring distance using fundamental physical properties and actually measuring those. And using the Planck constant, now there's a way they've, they've said to ra the ratio of energy uh, to frequency of a photon measured to a very precise value. Well, back in 1889, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do that. And it's only, I think, last year they actually came up with that standard definition. So finally, after all these years, maybe a mass in kilogram actually has a fundamental definition. Otherwise, it's kind of like this back calculation from a force. So we've got a mass and we've got a force, and they're two philosophically different things. So force equals mass times acceleration. We're going to go back to the equations. So in the strict SI system, it's pretty straightforward. Newtons equals kilograms times meters per second squared. And hence density, which we're often interested in, is going to be in the same units, kilograms per meter cubed. Now, that's, that's nice. And often, if, if I don't I get into a tangle, I convert everything to that strict SI system, and it, it works out very nicely. US system, this is where we have problems, because we've got pound force. So that's the force exerted by, and it's a pound we measure on the scale, is something times uh, acceleration, inches per second squared. So that something in square brackets is the mass. So that mass has to be a consistent set of units. It becomes a horrible set of units. It's pound force basically divided by acceleration. So Turned it upside down, it's pound four seconds squared per inch. Nobody likes that. And now I've got to divide that by inches cubed to get my density. And look at these horrible units here, pound four seconds squared per inch to the fourth. Um, on the dynamics course, we have a great fun as people say, why is it divided by inch to the fourth? It should be inch to the cubed. It's just the system of units kind of works out. So it gives us a very strange definition for density. And we usually get a very small value. For aluminium, for example, in pound per cubic inch is 0.1, but we've got to divide by 3 to 6.4. So in a consistent set of units, it's 0.259 e to the minus 3, and then this thing. 
And that upsets people because they see that number going and think, well, where does this come from? But it is a consistent set of units. Now, that, that is a problem. Um, and density working in that, I'm not going to read it all out again, is a hopeless thing to work with. So my interpretation is a pound mass is the mass of a body which weighs one pound force. In a gravitational system, I'm going to assume that we're working with inches. I'm going to work with 386.4. So I just take my pound force and I just divide by gravity. And I call that a pound mass. Now, people, I hope, are going to say, that's not the definition of the pound mass. There's something much more, well, I think it's kind of more obscure than that, and really quite opaque. We've got poundles, we've got slugs, we've got horrible things like that, slinches, uh, slinch, it's a horrible thing. So if we just say a pound mass, and this is like the Tony Abbey definition, we're going to take um, our units and basically say 100 pound force divided by 386.4, and that's 0.259 pound mass. And I often abbreviate it to pound mass, uh, LBM. And I set that up in front in every project and say, this is what I'm doing. This is my uh, assumption. And in fact, that flows really nicely through FEA then, because we've actually got a consistent unit uh, conversion all the way through. If I apply 100 grand, uh, 1G sorry, back to my 100 pound mass, I get back out 100 pound force. Density then becomes a bit easier to work with because I've got my pound mass per cubic inches. So my uh, density then, instead of these horrible units up here, is 0.259 e to the minus 3 pound mass per cubic inch, which I can get some kind of rational handle on. So I really recommend this kind of approach. And um, by all means, uh, email me um, you know, uh, on LinkedIn and so on. Let's have a discussion about it. After 40 years, I'm, I'm, what's the word, in, in, intransigent. I think that's a very big, long word. I, you're not going to shift me on that one. So, FEA uh, model in US units is consistently set up in pound mass and mass density unit. It just proceeds very logically. So my strong recommendations for those of you, again, uh, in Europe who think, what is it? what are these units? Work in inches, divide all weights by 386.4, divide weight density by 386.4. Now, many preprocessors which are CAA-centric have material libraries already in these units, if you look. A CAD embedded programs are a bit psychotic here. Sometimes on the geometry side, they show pound weight. So like um, uh, density would be 0.1 for aluminium. But then they quickly, under the covers, switch it to pound mass for simulation. So they are 0.1 divided by 386.4, that strange number. They seem to reconcile it. I haven't actually found a bug in any of the programs, but it can be a bit of a, a wild ride as you kind of try and track these, these units through. Um, so that I've, I've been beating up the US system, and you might have switched off if you're uh, in, in Europe. But hang on. We also have issues with, uh, with SI. Um, straying from strict SI also has uh, issues. As I mentioned, millimeters are very conven convenient. And if we're doing static analysis, it all works out nicely. We end up with megapascals. We end up with millimeters. In dynamics, it's not quite so nice. So force equals mass times acceleration. This is our strict system. So I've used here aluminum, for example, density 2710 kilograms per, per cubic meter. That's nice. But if I want to work in millimeters, I basically divided my meters by 1,000. I've got to multiply, multiply my kilograms by 1,000. So I get a metric ton. Now, not too bad, but now means that all my, uh, my masses are going to be in tons. But the killer is my densities have got to be in tons per cubic millimeter. And that means like aluminium becomes a very, very strange number, like 2.7 e to the minus 9. And that is, is a tough thing to kind of swallow. My first uh, attempt at doing impact analysis, I used uh, uh, an explicit code. And what happened was I, we were working with nuclear flasks, and I put the wrong units in. I basically worked with a system of newtons, kilograms, and millimeters. So uh, if you think that through, I applied um, uh, e to the 9, e to the 12, actually, times too much um, mass. And so my nuclear flask just splattered itself over here. I was going to use a cow pat, but I thought that was a bit nasty. So this nuclear flask just comes down and smears itself over because the density of this particular material is like greater than uh, like a dark star or something like that. So um, uh, SI systems, anything 
uh, sorry, metric systems, anything with dynamics, be careful. Living in the world of statics, everything's nice. You come to dynamics, it's not nice. You've got to, you've got to follow this through. So, David, there's a, the second poll there. Yep. Uh, I mean, we've heard about the, the pitfalls there. We're going to open a poll. Have you ever been caught out by the mass to weight conversion? We'll open the poll now. You have about 30 seconds to answer. Have you ever been caught out by the mass to weight conversion? Yes, no, or it doesn't apply. So you've never tried. So the results are coming in. Uh, it's looking very like most people have been caught out so far. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's it's kind of, it's, as we're going on here, there's still uh, a few seconds left. I've set this one to last for too long, but give you another five or, five or six seconds to respond to that one. Have you ever been caught out by the mass weight conversion? I think that's fairly obvious. 50% of respondents so far, you've got another 30 seconds, 50% have been caught out. So I think that's fairly resounding. 50% have, 18% say that they haven't been caught out. Uh, and 30% of you haven't responded yet. Come on, people. It's, it may be because it's never done uh, dynamic analysis or never used inertia, so it's never kind of come, come up. But um, eighteen percent have never got caught out. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I want you to come and work for me. <laughs> yeah, so that that's that. So out of everyone, we had thirty percent of you didn't answer. Don't know why. Uh, like we were saying, but ha half of the people that responded, or half half of the attendees, have been caught out. Like we said, 18% haven't been caught out, so that's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I, I would expect that to be of those responded to me almost 100%, but uh, it, it is a very, very tricky area. So I think, again, the poll kind of uh, confirms that. So, again, if you've got a mixed project, mixed system, then uh, you, you, you've got to think about it. As I said, I've seen grown men uh, end up in tears over these kind of conversions. So thanks very much for that, David. That, that's great. Um, so, finally, <laughs> the really awful conversion example. Now, you don't have to follow all this through, but I just want to show how horrible things can get. Fracture mechanics are interested in the growth rate of a crack. And we have this Paris law, and they found that if we plot on a log-log scale, we're going to actually, for this phase of the crack development, we've got a linear relationship in log-log. So here's a straight line in here. But we need to have a coefficient and an exponent. Uh, so C and M are material constants, so they are fundamental material constants. Now, uh, the stress intensity range, stress intensity is the tendency to, to want to develop a crack. So that has its own strange unit. So we'll get into that very, very briefly. Um, this is the stress intensity factor. It's basically some correction factor, a field stress, and then the square root of pi times the crack length. So that's the right mixture of units. This is just a typical set of um, the old uh, uh, Rook and Cartwright kind of uh, volumes and so on to tell you what that correction factor is going to use in here. You plug in your field, uh, your, your growth stress in there, and then you've got an estimate of the stress intensity factor. You compare this to fracture toughness, and that tells you what's going to happen. So the units here are stress, which is sitting here, times the square root of length. So that's really nasty. We've got newtons per meter squared times meter to the half, which we can rationalize, but that's the fundamental units. PSI times inches to the half. So it's getting a little bit abstract already. Now we want to convert um, the units for the Paris coefficient. And this is a real pain to me because C, uh, when we look up, we want data to say, well, for our particular material, uh, we've got that graph running back there. What's, what's C? What's M? Well, um, M, we can figure out, okay, that's actually dimensionless. But now we want to convert. And most data, that graphical kind of data, uses mega newtons or megapascals if we're working in uh, metric units as a foundation. If we've got an FEA model. We're going to be working newtons, meters, seconds, or maybe newtons, millimeter seconds, but not mega newtons, meters, seconds. That would be a real pain to, to do that. So the conversion to get from... Um, Newtons meters second, or mega newtons, which the data is given into newton meters seconds, are rather tricky. And the Paris law here, I've modified it so the exponent m star. I've used m star because unfortunately I'm going to use m for meter units. So just kind of bear that in mind. 
So in terms of the units, uh, assume the material is quoted on a megapascal basis. Units of delta K are the same as Ki, and so we've got our megapascals meter to the half here. So that would be a consistent set of, of units there. But I don't want to do that. I want to convert over. So I want to get from megapascals, this system here in megapascals, quoted typically, to newtons per meter squared. And so you'd think, well, that's going to be straightforward. It's just going to be a, a, um, a conversion of 1e or 1e to the 6. But if we work it through, we've got me, um, meters per cycle equals units of C, which we'll keep buried for the moment. We said uh, K is going to be megapascals at stress times length to the half, all to the power m star. Remember, we've got m star there. That's my exponent. So we can drop the cycle units because they're di dimensional. So we can work it through. And as we work it through, we end up with our units of C are a factor of 1 over 10 to the 6, which is what we'd expect, but times this m star. So m star is a physical number um, uh, or physical parameter, and it sneaks into the conversion. So the actual conversion is 1 over 10 to 6 times m star, whatever m star is. So look over here. We've got m is 2.8. That means my conversion factor now becomes 1 over 10 to the 6 times 2.8. And that nice 1.212 e to the minus 12 factor on C becomes 1.9 e to the minus 29. And that is mind-boggling. And I've checked it out on a crack growth spreadsheet on FEA solutions and so on. So there I've got this incestuous conversion unit, not just our nice units here, but a parameter in there, 2.8. Somebody says, well, M is, is not 2.8. It should be 2.4. I've got to redo the conversion again. And that, um, I've lost, uh, quite, I haven't got much hair left, but that, I've lost uh, even more over that one. A metric, uh, sorry, um, US is, uh, I typically, they quote them in KSI for some reason. It's thousands of pounds per square inch. I want to get back to PSI. I won't go through it all again, but basically we can follow through very logically. And believe me, I spent many hours making sure that I think this is right. So now the conversion factor is 1 over 10 to the power 3, which is the straight conversion here, but sneaky in that M star again. And that's, that's, a real, that's a real swine because you're just not... I'm not expecting that. That's kind of like something coming from another universe. We've got metric conver uh, a conversion with, with a variable factor in it. So I just want to end up with this. So slightly tongue-in-cheek. I've gone over very long here, David. Uh, imperial ton... Nice units, 20 hundred weights. 100 weight is 8 stone. 1 stone is 40 pounds. So very logically, an imperial ton is 2,240 pounds. Simple stuff. Love it. Love the old system. Uh, metric ton is 1,000 kilograms. But a simple kind of uh, conversion factor, we don't get too philosophical, that's 2.2 pounds. So metric ton is 2,200 pounds. There's only a 1.8% difference in there. So back in the day, did they figure this out? I, I don't think so. So it's an amazing coincidence, 1.8% difference. And then in the US, which is in the background here, you go and spoil things. You use short tons, 2,000 pounds. And that's another story where things go wrong using short tons instead of the long tons. But I just thought that was, units are, units are fascinating. There's actually a website which gives all sorts of different units. And you can work out with things like, um, I love flush, uh, gallons per flush is what comes out of your toilet, for example. <laughs> and all sorts of fascinating unit systems like that. Um, so units can cause, in conclusion, a lot of errors. They can be simple finger trouble, or they can be very difficult phys physical units. That there, a little bit of philosophy is required there. So to keep out of trouble, use physical equations. Go back to the equations. Work up consistent units. And in our FEA model, watch out for silly answers. I've had answers in kilometers instead of millimeters and the other way around. So uh, the final arbiter is always the FEA, what comes out, and, and that's kind of our check. So that's it for, for this session. Uh, thanks very much for watching. For watching. For watching. <laughs> and on that um, spoonerism, maybe. No, it isn't spoonerism. On that tongue twist, David, I'll hand over to you to, to do the, uh, the um, marketing thing for us. That's bizarre. I was, we were discussing spoonerisms last night over dinner, and that's a true story. That was, as you uh, would. <laughs> as, as you would. Thanks very much for, uh, for your presentation. It was good to get some feedback.
uh, from from the people that from everyone that's listening. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, Tony, for your presentation. Some great stories in there. Uh, the next session will be on August seventh, and we'll be asking: Can designers really take advantage of FEA strength and stiffness predictions? You can register now for that session on the NAFEMS and FE Training website. Also, draw your attention to our upcoming e-learning classes. Uh, Tony's running a few starting in the middle of August, Joints and Connections on the 19th, and Advanced Dynamics on the 20th. So head over to nafems.org. You can take a look at the range of e-learning classes that are available uh, where you can get some more in-depth training with Tony. So we do have uh, a few questions that have come in uh, during the, your presentation, Tony. Hopefully, you can see those on the site. So um, Ivor makes the comment, um, if your graphics show the units too, it helps to identify the errors, even if late during uh, post-processing. The graphs without units are always double treacherous. Uh, yes, I remember a guy um, uh, gave his final um, presentation, report presentation uh, at college, and he, he went through about 12 slides with graphs on. He didn't put any units on any of them. And so at the end of that, he was completely confused. We were completely confused. That's a lesson I've never, I've never forgotten. So it's a, that's a very good, uh, very good point there. Steve Fisher makes a comment. Quite often, an issue is with mass. Sometimes in Nastran type solvers, a pram weight mass uh, is used, like pram weight mass, and then the value of one point e, one e three. So the mass and density is in kilograms, but is not then. Um, megagrams if the dimensions are in millimeters. Yeah, um, this, this uh, is often a, a conversion unit, and that was basically pram weight mass um, in Nastran and variants like that. So again, um, going to a specific example, the idea is you put in 1 over G, so you're basically converting your weight to a mass. That was the fundamental application. So occasionally we use that, and, you, and it's a bit annoying again, because you've got to put 1 over G, 1 over 386.4, but you can use it for other other means. And that, that as you say here, kind of on the, on the fly kind of conversions, you really got to think through the implications of what you put in there through all of your, again, it comes down to the fundamental equations in there. Colin makes the point, kilograms force comes from an earlier metric system called MKS, superseded by SI that introduced Pascal's. Oh, gosh, you're right. I, you've taken me right back to my physics A-level. That was the first time I got metricated. And oh, gosh, MKS brings back uh, horror stories. That was an attempt to get back to it like an equivalent to a weight system, but in, in metrics. So thank you for that. Yep, that's, that's a <laughs> horror stories, the horrible memories of uh, old physics textbooks there. Um, US uses both pound mass. This is, again, Colin makes a comment. US uses both pound mass and pound force. That was the same as MKS kilograms and kilograms force. It was SI, not metrication, that, that separated these. I, I kind of, I, I would still defy anybody to say, show me the legal definition of a mass in a US system. There's a legal definition in the um, metric system, whether we want to say the final system and the national, which kind of tidied everything up. Uh, and that is this thing sitting under the bell jars in, in Paris. There isn't really a legalistic definition of what a pound mass in the US system is. And that's my that's my basic thesis. So if I invent my definition of a pound mass, it's as good as anybody else's. Um, and I think it's consistent. So yeah, um, there, are, there are all sorts of definitions. There are several definitions of pound mass, but I, I like to stick to mine. Mike makes a comment, I found it most useful to differentiate between the two as pounds force versus pound mass in US systems. I completely agree. Pounds force, I'm thinking weight. Pounds mass, uh, in other words, what's the force exerted by this thing? Pound mass is how much mass is, in, how much matter, sorry, how much matter is there in this thing? And that's the difference. One is a force. One is how much stuff is in there. And how much stuff is in an apple? How much stuff is in a I don't know, um, an aircraft, uh, a Boeing 7047, how much matter is in there? That's a difficult philosophical uh, concept. But we talk about kilograms, and if it weighs, and goodness knows how many kilograms, then we mean that's the amount of matter in that aircraft is that much kilograms. 
as opposed to it mean, as opposed to it weighs this much pounds force. <laughs> Ivor says it's time for you to learn French, and the French way of thinking to go to SI even in the US. Um, as I say, I, I'm schizoid. Par uh, I, some projects are in uh, SI, some are in US. I, I did learn French as a schoolboy. I try very hard to get my French pronunciation right. Notice I put tunnies. I pronounce it as tunnies. I don't know if that's hybrid uh, French-English, but I, I try my best there. Darren says, in handling a European product in USA, the original drawing and SI units give the, the welders on the shop floor a hard time, let alone the engineers. Now we edit drawings to show both dimensions. That's a great way of doing it, lay it out both. I've been known to do an FE analysis twice, and that's what I did with this particular surveyor. I said, look, here's the, here's the result completely in US units. Here's the result completely in metric units, and they are the same. Even that didn't work. So I think I agree with you, Darren, it, you know, whatever we can do there. Uh, Conan says, makes the point, lots of US textbooks and papers used formally, they're not consistent, so the numbers are unit sensitive. Solution in MathCAD is to divide the input variables in the equation by their units, then multiply the resulting number by the output units. Oh, that was interesting because in the, the kind of the warm up, Colin was mentioning how they, they did that. So, a very interesting approach there. Um, Oliver, yeah, Oliver makes the point ECTS are based on a mix of imperial and metric. Um, this gives lots of potential for headaches and errors. So, we use MathCAD as much as possible to avoid issues. When we must use Excel, we do spot checks in MathCAD to convert, convert, com, confirm conversions in Excel. Yeah, uh, uh, again, uh, we we we, um, <laughs> we try to be software agnostic, but uh, MathCAD kind of sits and MATLAB and and those others kind of and Excel sit on the side. Uh, I use that. I can consider them as tools, perhaps rather than, than mainstream FEA. <laughs> Ivor says, um, this just confirms I'm right to keep away from US units and impose SI. <laughs> Good luck in the US. <laughs> People trying to impose systems in the US, it doesn't work. Free spirits in the US. Uh, Jack Reimer says, with the drop test mistake, was that in October 2003? Um, no, it actually uh, was actually, I first came across this, it's more like. Uh, I think 1992, 1993, um, and I phoned up the help desk, and it was, uh, I'll tell the name of the, uh, the, the software, it was uh, Ovarup was supporting, uh, Oasis was supporting uh, the LS Dyna product, and a, a very good uh, friend of mine, he, I just said, um, I'm having problems with these units, and he just said to me, Tony, force equals mass times acceleration, and just hung up. <laughs> so that actually was a very, very good lesson, because I thought, you know what, he's right, and I had worked it through, and that was better than trying to just say, well, just use this number or that number. So um, again, uh, that was um, uh, a very good lesson. Yeah, uh, and Nick uh, kind of confirms um, conversion from imperial units to, 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 to metric when using dynamics or energy calculations. Energy calculations, I did introduce BTUs, British thermal units, there's another nightmare converting uh, energy to, to joules um, or ergs or whatever we want to use. Uh, I just didn't go there. I didn't have time to do that. Um, so he, he makes the point, I sometimes convert my givens from imperial to metric just to make sure I'm on track. And I think I think that's absolutely uh, absolutely right. Jens <laughs> makes the cryptic comment, um, rotational acceleration, yes. Then now we've got... Um, uh, angles, uh, so we're, we're accelerating angles per second squared. So it's like Hertz, kind of like on steroids, if you like. Well, now we've got uh, the, the acceleration terms in there. Again, um, are we talking about radians? We're talking about um, degrees, and can be uh, can be uh, can be complicated. Randy makes the comment: units are an issue, but I think if you don't know what the answer is, you are seeking looks like, along with the size of the answer, you shouldn't be running the analysis in the first place, meaning if you mess up the units, there should be, and then I think there's a little, should be a red flag. Not sure if all my comments went through. Yeah, that they did. Um, yes, um, and this is where I say go back to the equations, go back to the physical uh, relationship. The left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Work that through in the units. Um, 
sometimes uh, this is where the the the, um, the band-aid uh, of um, programs, particularly preprocessors, trying to help you, you can end up double booking. Like I double booked my flight from Girona to um, to Bordeaux. I converted my what well, already in uh, US in gallons to imperial gallons, and then I converted back from imperial gallons back to US gallons, I think, and ended up with a 20% magic increase, virtual increase in my tank capacity, which, which luckily for me wasn't fatal, but sadly in uh, the world of aviation, there have been many fatal instances of, of that. Uh, we used to have a fly, uh, an old saying, which is, I learned about flying from that, and that, yes, I learned about flying from that. <laughs> There's a lovely pun here from Florent. I assume it's a pun. US is moving forward uh, the metric system, but inch by inch. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lovely quote. I'm going to steal that, Florent. I like that. Um, Iva gives a reference here, which I'll paste in the um, in the video. It's Handbook of Mass, Me Mass Measurement by Frank E. Jones uh, uh, and, and co. Um, finding a textbook which gives the right units you want to work in somehow makes things definitive. That's actually how I broke the impasse with my surveyor um, and basically I photocopied or scanned the page from the textbook that said this equals that and I never heard from him again. So my sort of whatever it was long period of trying to convince him um, didn't work but you put it in the textbook and say hey this is the conversion and then that was that was okay. Gustavo, um, horror story, the classic NASA mistake. I guess you're perhaps referring to the Hubble telescope, the, the apocryphal story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or a real story. Uh, in other words, is it, it's kind of like urban myth. Is the Hubble space um, telescope, the mirror, was ground to the wrong specification. So it's blurred for many years till I can't remember if they did a spacewalk or somehow they kind of swapped it out. But yeah. <laughs> Jack says, I recall an article in the Benchmark magazine. The author was so ashamed that he remained anonymous. A man sitting here in his office will know who that is. Are you going to tell, David? I, I can't compromise that. As soon as I saw that, I remember the same article, Jack. Uh, swore to secrecy, I'm afraid. <laughs> there you go. I tried, Jack. <laughs> Tony says... Um, in rheology, torque is often specified in dynes per centimeter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, lots of lots of horrible examples like that. Um, again, my favorite, uh, apart from the, the uh, uh, fracture mechanics issue, is like anything to do with BTUs there. Uh, and Randy makes a comment. I rely on open source products, and sometimes I'm not totally clear about what units are assumed in or out. I did a quick Google search to see if I could find a definition. Um, of how to convert from um, kilograms per meter cubed to tonnes per millimeter cubed. And I actually did a search to say, show me a density in tonnes per millimeter cubed. I couldn't find it. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's surprisingly difficult to, to work with these systems sometimes. We're probably um, running out of time now, David, so I think uh, I'll probably wrap it up there. Um, again, if there are any other horror stories, please um, uh, send me an email, uh, a link to whatever. There have been quite a few that come through. And again, I apologize to those folks. I didn't manage to get a chance to, to, to come in there with those. I think maybe we can have a follow-up of favorite horror, horror, favorite horror stories coming from, uh, from the community there. So I think at that point, David, I'll hand back to you to, to wrap the show up for us. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, and thanks to everyone for your questions and for joining in today. Uh, it's been a good session as usual. Thanks, Tony, for his time. Our next session will be on August 7th. Uh, and Tony will be asking if designers can really take advantage of FEA strength and stiffness predictions. As well as that, we have a few e-learning classes uh, which are coming up during August, Joints and Connections on the 19th and Advanced Dynamics on the 20th, both uh, uh, taken tutored by Tony. Uh, so Tony's got a very busy August coming up. So have a look at that. Have a look on the NAFEMS and FE training website. We'll be posting the recording of today's talking shop uh, very shortly on both sites. We thank you very much for attending today. We hope you have a good weekend and we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks' time. Goodbye for now. 
Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.